Hi, everybody. Welcome to tonight's program. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate everybody coming. Tonight is a very, very special share with very close friends of ours that are basically becoming regulars on the program. So thank you for coming. Uh, tonight is Sheer 102. I could probably imagine 102. Wow. Um, the Coach Menachem Let's Get Real program. So again, for all the people that are here, this share is uh, self-made through people like that have come on every week and they post it on the WhatsApp and they let people know about it. If anybody wants to get every Sunday the WhatsApp with the share, please, please text me at 848-525-0066 and I'll send you every Sunday the flyer. You can post it on your family chats, on your statuses. Let people know about it. You can go to MenachemBurnfall.com. You could sign up for the weekly email. You get two emails a week, one for the replay and one for the following share. Um, if anybody's watching the replay of this video on YouTube, click on the like button and the subscribe button. So every Monday morning when Menachem uploads the share of the week, you get notified and um, enjoy it. But first, I want to start off with thanking all of our advertising sponsors that promote us on all the digital platforms. First here, the Lakewood Scoop here in Lakewood. A uh, special thank you to Rabbi Yanif Kazak, Ellie and Ariel from Five Town Central for posting on their websites and letting people know about it. A special thank you to Chayla Kaufman and Shmuel Summer from JCM, the Jewish Content Network, for always promoting us across all the digital digital platforms. The Coach Menachem Show is collaborating with OK Clarity to bring greater health and wellness to the Jewish community around the globe. OK Clarity is the online platform for mental health support the Jewish community. OKClarity.com, you'll find the best therapists, coaches, nutritionists, engage in, engage in forums and stay as far as links will be emailed after the show. Again, for anybody who's here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, um, we always have a different share. We have different abundant, different topics. Next week, we're going to have a little uh, feed off of this. We have a, a rabbi coming on, Rabbi Aaron Lane. from He's the head shliach in Panama City for 28 years. He wrote a book on marriage. It's called GPS of Marriage. I didn't read the book, but I heard he's an excellent speaker and it's an excellent book. And uh, hopefully it'll be a catapult from tonight's conversation. So we'll go from marriage to marriage and we'll see how it goes. So please join us. Anybody who's here tonight should definitely be here next week also. Um, so it should be an amazing program. Let, you know, let people know about it. Tonight we have the schus and the honor of having uh, the most dynamic couple that I know. Both uh, doctors, right? Dr. Akiva Perlman and Dr. Tamar Perlman. Um, they were here once before and I'm so happy they're coming back for round two. And uh, should, tonight should be a meaningful and exciting show. Tonight, Shear 102, and we started doing a gematria, Dr. Proman. It's a new thing, a new shtick that we started a gematria for the show. So we came out with tonight's gematria. This is my friend, Arnar Fried. He came up with the gematria. 102 is the gematria elekenu, our God. So he said, when you have a shalom bias and you have a marriage, shkanti b'soichem, Hashem is part of it. So to get elekenu, Mr. Shem, after this year, will be part of elekenu. Let's start off with opening. Coach Menachem, what are we talking about tonight? Zog, Zog. What, what great, are we great question. Great question. So I first want to welcome everyone. Yes, Bar Hashem, we're up to Shir number 102. And uh, it's a privilege to have back Dr. and Dr. Perlman. And Bar Hashem, the feedback from last time was really amazing. And um, there's so much more. From the emails that came in, we're talking about everybody wants to know what it doesn't say in the book. You're talking about people who read all marriage books. And they're trying to figure it out. So maybe tonight they're going to get the answer. That thing that doesn't say in the book. But from the questions that came in, you're talking about marriage. There's so many different levels, different things that come up. Everybody in their own situation trying to figure out how, what, my part. And uh, especially today's days, um, we, we live in a fast-paced world. Many people live outside their home through social media and they get to see other people's perfect moments. And then they come home and trying to figure out where am I? And why am I not getting what I need in marriage? And there's, again, we're talking about people who are trying to work and even those, they go for help. What do I do when my spouse doesn't, doesn't feel he needs to, he or she, needs the help i'm doing all the work so it, it does bring up many 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 uh hardships that people have many struggles and um hopefully tonight in mr shem will get to uh get some more answers that we're looking for the truth is when i see you dr perlman it brings up the, the word vulnerability which many people felt last time when you were on just to see what comes up 
for everybody it's different and uh you can't control this is a part part of therapy you know everybody's different see what happens so here we are mr shem tonight another open discussion and um hopefully everybody will be able to take what they need to just take their marriage to just at least to the next level to understand what's my next step what do i need to do to enhance and understand a little bit clearly what am I looking for. So thank you very much for being with us tonight. And we shall have a lot of siyata de shmaya, Mitz Hashem. Amen. Beautiful opening. Okay, so tonight we're talking about what they don't talk about in marriage books, what clients have taught us, what makes and, what makes and breaks a marriage. So it's a very uh, powerful topic. Uh, tonight's year, we're going to learn Zeichen Nishmas, uh, sponsored by Avivit and Yisrael Mayor Mikili. Memory of Leil Nishmas, Zechariah Shimon HaKoyen. Ben Yitzchak, Rabbi Wallstein, who just left there. So we're going to do the share and the schus for all the hundreds of people that are here, the thousands of people, uh, which will be a schus for his neshama. He did a lot for Chai, so he helped a lot of people. And um, it should be a schus for him. And I want to um, first start off with Dr. Akiva Perman to give the opening uh, the opening pitch over here. So I'll read your bio, and then uh, the floor is yours. Okay, Dr. Akiva Perman is a professor of lecture on topics of abuse, addiction, trauma, a fellow traveler from those who suffer in silence. He has educated nearly a thousand from social workers from our community and currently serving as a professor at the Wurzburger School of Social Work. Dr. Perman is the clinical director of ODA's Wellness Center, a clinic which serves the Hasidic community in Williamsburg. He maintains a practice in Fresh Meadows where he resides with his wife, Tamar, and children. Thank you so much for having us. It's a great honor. We really, uh, we really enjoyed the last time. And also like the, the feedback was very meaningful to us. It was very special. And especially to see a certain like familiar faces, people that we've journeyed alongside over the years. It's really, really special. Um, I just love for Uh, Menachem, can you hear him? It's a, it's a little unclear. Let's wait one minute. Wait one minute because your connection is like choppy. Might have to use your cell phone. No, no, we'll just to wait till we get better. Okay. Try again. Let's let's see if it works now. Okay. Not from beginning. Is it better now? Now it's good. Yeah. Uh, it's better now. good. Okay. Yeah, I might have to stop you. If I stop uh, you, use your cell phone. Wonderful. We'll find a way with Hashem's help. We'll journey together. Um, all I would say is uh, it's just a great honor to be back. Uh, we really enjoyed being here last time. Uh, the feedback was really special and wonderful. And, and in a forum like this, it's a very unique space where people just bring themselves in fully. It's a vulnerable environment and it's just an honor to be here. And there's so many people that we've journeyed, both of us have journeyed alongside. And I obviously want to point each one out. Um, but for the sake of time, uh, you know who you are, and thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting us, and thank you for journeying alongside us in, in a very rich life um, that, that we try our best to, to be present with, with the hope that it would find a way to enhance others. Uh, I can say for certainty that, that the people that we know and you, those that we don't know, um, you've enhanced our lives a tremendous amount. Um, it's hard to not mention my older brother, Vitzal. Love him. Okay, um, so I wanted to speak a little bit about trauma and relationships. I know that Tamara is going to speak about some other ideas. Um, and it's very clear for anyone in a relationship that their traumas emerge almost immediately um, in that space. It's not a coincidence that the majority of people um, either at the beginning of the relationship. Could we hear? I think we should try a cell phone because, it, like, every minute it like goes into that fuzzy, fuzzy much sliding on my cell phone. Sorry. I I don't mind. Let's get it done. I want Give it to be clear. Second. I want everybody to be able to hear. Okay. Let's give it a little Yeah, but it keeps on getting fuzzy. I know. Going to zoom. This is four. a this is a parallel process of what happens then with you know you're trying to get ideas across to each other. And it's fuzzy. You can't hear each other. What's going on? And then you have to, but you don't have another device. You just have each other to communicate. Exactly. Like this, this is parallel to what happens in marriages all the time. 
Okay, we just left them on. Should we try that? Um, when okay, they muted. It says. Oh, there they go. Okay, I'll mute them. It's on this. Yeah. Hold on, second. I need to rename it. There's nothing wrong with it. Oh, what this is. Where is that? It's, like, we'll it's gonna be on the next page. So we'll make them. Uh... Opinion. Tell them to raise their hands. Okay, one second. We got it. We got it. We got it. They should just raise their hand. Coast. When I speak, I'll close the front. One second. Oh, my. I have to choose which one. One second. Where did they go? Yeah. For some reason, the cell phone is not turning on the mic. Why is the mic not turning on? There they go. There they go. Okay, got it. I'm you. Okay. Okay. Is yeah, that better? Much better. Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, this will. This is what it's gonna do. There, whatever static there is in marriages, it's going to oh. just clarify it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start again quickly. Um, we can see much less people here now, but that's okay. We'll make it work. We know you're there. Yes. The, um, one of the things I was starting to speak about in trauma and relationships is that we all know anyone in a relationship um, almost immediately discovers that their deepest traumas will automatically emerge in this space. They will be uh, discovered, found out. Um, it's going to be something that will remain with them, that will live with them, um, and almost exacerbate the parts of themselves that are not not really aware of of, of that element. Um, and I want to speak about one idea, and then we'll move on from there. There's there's an idea that Eric Fromm spoke about, who was a, a Jewish analyst, and he spoke about this in a book called The Art of Loving. Um, and it was a concept that had a profound effect. This is actually from the books, but it's a very, it's not a very well-known book. Um, but he speaks a lot about this idea of mature and immature love. And I just want to share this one concept and then we can take it from there. Um, where he says this, he says, most of us, especially people who sort of have a history of suffering, a history of not being seen, not being known, not being valued. When they looked at the mirror at the end of the day, they turned away in shame they had a hard, they, they had some hardship with themselves, their own essence. And, um, and as a result of that, they make their way into a relationship and they're trying to discover something. So what he calls immature love is that they don't feel complete, they don't feel whole. And all they want is the other person to complete them. They want the other person to somehow swoop in, discover the parts that are, are not really whole and not complete, and just complete them with that. And I think you see this, the people very early in relationships, especially those who are deprived of a lot of love in their lives, they're very prone to like deeply falling in love in, in a way that we would call immature to some degree. They fall in love for the little things, the simple things, that we complete each other's sentences. Um, we do things, we like the same foods. These are things that are wonderful. It's wonderful in life to, to like the same foods and like going to the same places, but it's not really representative or indicative of something that's profound and deep and nurtured and worked through. It is just a, an expression of, I have something in my life that is not complete, that is not whole, and the other completes that. So I have a big gaping hole inside of myself, and then this other person fills that up. And I think for most of us, at least in the beginning of a relationship, that's what we're looking for. And then we realize that the other person has a self, and the other person is not only there to make us feel whole, and not only there to make us feel better about ourselves, they're also there for themselves, for their own needs, their own sense of being, their own sense of purpose in this world. Um, and what he shares about is another idea, which we're going to talk about, is as a form of mature love. A mature love, love then becomes a choice. It's almost like a person feels whole and intact and complete. And then they ask themselves the question is, what's a, a better way to be complete in my life? And they determine that being in a relationship, which will inevitably bring about challenges, being in a relationship that will bring about um, the expression of something new, something different, 
um, that will allow me to go beyond myself. It'll challenge me to become a bigger and better human being. And every relationship does, so long as we're doing it right. Um, and those people, they, they, they have a self, the other person has a self, and they choose to engage in a relationship with one another. They choose to be present because they'd like to journey together. They like to journey beside one another so they can have a very, very meaningful life with one another. Um, so I just want to share that very that one idea um, where the, tra the traumatic mind very often looks at a relationship as something that it's there to complete them. And the whole mind looks at it as a relationship as something that could enhance them and could bring about some greater change and greater difference in this world. Um, and we'll go deeper into this and obviously touch upon some other elements of trauma as well. But I want to turn it over to tomorrow after tomorrow. It's a great honor to be here with you. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as you're speaking about this idea of, of starting off feeling connected and then recognizing the other one is another person and the panic of that that occurs at, at any point in, in, in the relationship, you know, it makes me think about the space between a couple. And when I actually do couples therapy, I don't have the couple sit next to each other. I have the couple sit in front of each other because my client isn't, isn't either of the couple, either of the members, it's the space between them. So, you know, when you come into a relationship, <clears throat> when you start your marriage, you don't get in there saying, hey, this is not gonna work. When you come into a relationship, hope is of the biggest places that it has in any relationship is hope. In, in a marriage, in the beginning of a marriage, hope is the primary feeling because you don't just marry for the moment, you marry for down the line. So the beginning of any relationship is hope. And what I see happens when a couple comes into couples therapy is something very specific. There, is many different, there are many different presentations as to what brings a couple in, but there is one theme that's throughout. The theme is that usually, you know, when I see people individually, there is usually some pain, there is trauma, there is, there is um, a sense of stuck. When I see a couple, there is another element. This is not yet the theme, but this is the, an element. There is real confusion. Like, what are we supposed to do now? Like, there is real, real bilbul adat. Like, we don't know what to do. We don't know what's right, what's wrong. They feel crazy. They each feel crazy. They feel like they're right. And they also feel like they're crazy. And they obviously think that the other is crazy, but that's not news to us. But really, they really think crazy, like that they're crazy. They have no idea. These are adults. These are adults that are in relationship in a relationship already with each other for many years, most of the time. Or they're adults that just got into a relationship saying, Five months ago, we were in love. We thought we were gonna have the best marriage. So there's a lot of confusion. And what is the theme of the confusion? You know, <clears throat> you know, you were just talking about this, that there are really three elements in a marriage. There is the self, there is the other, and there is the unit. And these three elements need to work with each other. When you first come into a relationship, like I was saying earlier, there's this hope this feels comfortable. This is where the self feels really good. And this image of unit makes sense. We can see this together, we can build together. At a point where a couple comes into treatment, they can no longer see the self and the unit coexisting. That's where the confusion is. They're saying, can I remain intact and be myself if I, if I continue to give to you? If I give you what you need, I will not exist. Or if I give to the unit what it needs, I will not exist. You know, Gottman has these studies. He did a lot of studies and he, he did a lot of oh, videotapes of couples and he narrowed it down that in, it, Dr. Gottman in his labs that he was able to identify whether or not a couple was gonna get divorced in the next seven years down to like a 95% accuracy in like a few minute clip. And he identified this specific feeling that he saw from either one of the couple's members as contempt between them. I thought about this concept a lot. I studied Gottman a lot. And I think that if I may, 
there is a layer that's underneath contempt that's happening, that's causing this rift. You know, like the imagery that comes to me when I see a couple that's stuck in this space, when they come in with this confusion and pain, it's like soil that's completely dried up and it doesn't take in any nutrients. It's just dry and cracking. It's like a painful image to even conjure up. But that's what comes up to me when a couple comes in. It's a soil that's so thirsty for nurture and movement and growth, but so dry and cracking and in pain and confused. And even if only one member is like that and the other one keeps on pouring water on the soil, but the soil doesn't receive it, and it's still, there is no growth. And the other member at some point just dries up, has no more water to give. It is when one of the members loses that main element that they began with, which is hope. The hope that the self and the unit can coexist. That's why then the soil can't receive or the water has nothing else to give. So I would say that when there is no hope, that choice to love doesn't exist. Your choice is gone. You, you act within the marriage as if the marriage is already over. And whatever you do is without choice. So let's say you let things happen. You let her have her way, but it doesn't feel like choice. You feel resentment and disconnect. Or let's say you accept him the way he is, but it doesn't feel like choice. You feel disdain, you diminish him in your eyes, you don't respect him. Or you, you allow yourself to give, to give, but you don't, if it's not received, you feel taken advantage of, you feel like a victim. So the lack of hope leads to a feeling of no choice and it ends up cycling into a relationship that doesn't allow to feed and to grow. So I would say, you know, you're talking about the word choice. I would say that the two most important words of what, of what I would love to give over as to what a marriage requires, and in, in, in our opinion, is this concept of nurtured choice. It's a choice that you keep on making, not just when you get married, but every time an adjustment needs to occur. And the reason why it needs to be nurtured is because a marriage is actually not a natural relationship. It's, I think, of the most powerful relationships and one that I have learned in many svarim. Rabbi Schwartz talks about it in Da'at Nafshacha, that um, it, can, it is of, considered of the most powerful connections and of the deepest relationships, but it's one that's not natural. It's one that one can choose to be in or out of. And it requires a lot of nurturing. So what I think couples therapy does for the most part is just bring the hope and choice back into a, a relationship that lacks both. And that's what I hope to be able to together give over is some glimpses into how to do that when there's places of this dry soil in someone's relationship. It's beautiful. Wow, beautiful opening. Okay, we have a lot of people here now. And um, again, everybody who's here, we have Zaycha to have the problems with us. Amazing, amazing people. Um, we're going to take a poll just to get the feeling from the crowd. And then we're going to start with some questions. Anybody wants to ask a question? Obviously, if you want to go live, it's not for you. It's for your neighbor. We know that already. And um, we could, um, you know, we could, the live goes first. And um, text the questions to Usher Parnas. And uh, let's take a poll. Dr. Perlman, just make sure that your cell phone is plugged in, okay? Yeah, we're good with that. I'm going to try to restart my computer. It'll be easier to get back on there if we can. If not, that's okay. Such but I'm a, going to try. Such a good chair we have to have. You know, we have to have technical difficulties. That's the way it goes. That's always the way. We, we actually did it on purpose, but. <laughs> right. This is what a marriage is. This is what marriage work is all about. Exactly. It's exactly. always static. And it always catches you at a time that's, that's the worst time. You know, and often a lot of this conflicts come up when there's other things happening in your life and when there is also something with a child or something with your own personal life yeah i'm having a difficulty over here one second my computer's also locked yeah hold on a second
Yeah. Give me one second. I'm gonna open up the. Okay, here we go. Okay, so it's a three question poll. Here we go. Three questions, everybody. Answer honestly. Here we go. Before I got married, I didn't realize three choices. How much time and effort and how much time, effort and energy is needed in a relationship? How much of my past follows me into my marriage? Or option C, I didn't realize how rewarding marriage is. Those are the, that's the first question. Everybody answer one of those. Take, choose anything you want. It's anonymous. Number two, choose one positive character trait your spouse has that helps you. Your spouse has honesty and tr trustworthy. Option two, caring, devoted, great parent. Option three, patient, thought out, smart, and calm. Option four, I don't see any positive character traits in my spouse. Third question. I feel comfortable discussing with my spouse everything and anything, no secrets whatsoever. Option two, most things. I stay away from the embarrassing or scary stuff. Option three, whatever is needed. I don't feel a need to overshare. Those are the three questions. Roman, <coughs> interesting questions? Yeah. These are wonderful. What? Okay. Which one? To what? They'll come out of the way. Okay, three more seconds, and then we're gonna. Are you guys going on the computer? Or are we doing the whole thing on the phone? You want to switch back to the computer? No, no, we're good for now. If okay. I can make work, I'll let you know. Okay. Okay, so let's let's share the poll with everybody. Here we go. First question: is, Before I got married, I didn't realize. Thirty-eight percent of people didn't realize how much time, effort, and energy is needed in a relationship. Forty-seven percent of people. Most people here tonight didn't realize how much of my past follows me into my marriage. 15% of people said they didn't realize how rewarding marriage is. Question number two, one positive character trait that your spouse has that helps you. 28%, 26% of people said they're very honest and trustworthy. 48% of people said the caring, devoted, great parent. So that's the number one answer. 90% of people said patient, thought out, smart and calm. And 7% of people said they don't see any positive character traits in their spouse. Wow. Okay. Question number three. I feel comfortable discussing with my spouse. 44% of people here say everything and everything. There's no secrets whatsoever. 32% of people say most things. I stay away from the embarrassing stuff. And 24%, whatever is needed, I don't feel a need to overshare. From Dr. Perlman, any, any comments on the, on the, on the polls? It's, it, I love seeing polls because I love seeing where people are at, obviously, and what they're thinking. Right. Um, it, it's interesting to me that what feels most important for people to notice is care and devotion versus honesty and truth. I, it, to me, it's like a, it reflects on a choice of what it feels more important to focus on. That's what the second one. Mm -hmm. you, I think it's interesting also the first one that, that people, most people feel that they didn't realize how much of their past comes with them into the marriage. Yes. 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 We got, we, got, we got a lot of questions like that tonight, so we'll definitely want to cover that. And I'm actually surprised that with the 44% that everything, no secrets, mm -hmm. I thought that number would be less. Me too. I was surprised to see it that high, which is wonderful. Right. You know. Okay, let's start with the question. And again, anybody has a question, please text. Um, I could start, I should start it up again just to see if it'll work or if it's, it's too much of a hassle at this point. I think just leave it. I think it's good like this. I think it's really okay. good. Wonderful. Because we hear you clearly. The main thing is I want to hear you. If you want to turn your cell phone, your cell phone might be locked. You turn it sideways to get a more wider view if it's not locked. Okay. We're good. We're good. Okay. Mrs. Promo, I want to ask you this question, okay? A lot of people, yes. a lot of people uh, ask this question. It's a few different versions. I'm getting married shortly. I'm feeling very nervous. I have a few classmates that are already divorced. Plus, I have a sibling that's divorced. What are the most common mistakes couples make that breaks marriages in today's day and age, in your opinion? Mm. How much time do we have? <laughs> we have unlimited. As long as your cell phone doesn't die, we're good. <laughs> well, um, with the mistakes that couples make, um, I think that one is what, what you touched on, what Akiva touched on is, is, is expecting your spouse to heal you. One of my most favorite pieces that I had learned from Ramosha Shapiro is on the concept of dot. Like I had always thought about why is dot used when it comes to a relationship between a husband and wife. 
And Rav Moshe Shapiro sp speaks about, and this is one of these places where I found myself grounded in understanding and the lens um, made sense to me because I had seen it clinically so much. When we're born into an attachment relationship, we are kind of extensions. We see ourselves as the extensions of our parents. We rely on them fully. We're fully dependent for our connection is our survival. We can't exist without our parents. Um, and that attachment is an extension. You're an extension of me and I'm an extension of you. I can't exist without you. That occurs uh, when, when a child becomes an adolescent and go, grows into adulthood. It doesn't have to do with knowledge. It doesn't have to do with smarts. It doesn't have to do with how wise the kid is. It has to do with growing up. And, and the reason why that is used when it comes to the language of marriage is because only when you are grown up can you be in a relationship with another adult that is the type of relationship that is a marriage because with the dot you have the ability to see the other as separate from you it see external reality outside of you so as as kivi was talking about when you see the other as separate from you then you no longer seek for the other to repair you you know relationships bring up stuff you know, like water and oil, it just comes up right on top as, as soon as the couple gets married, all the attachment stuff just comes up and sometimes different parts, different life uh, experiences bring it up years down the line. And it makes us face our stuff. It makes us face the stuff that we haven't fully faced and dealt with. But if we expect the other to heal it, then we'll forever be disconnected and unhealed. But if we can, notice what we need to do in order to connect to the other. Let's say the other requires us to be less critical, but we grew up with a very critical mother, but the other requires us to be less critical, then it makes us face the parts of us that are critical in order to connect to the other. So it makes us heal that on our own and our spouses give us direction and support, but not healing. Um, so that's one mistake. The second mistake is almost the opposite in some ways, um, but it's not sharing enough. So it's expecting the other to know you. So I know this is spoken about often, but there's a lot of depth to it. And there's a good reason why people don't share what they need. You know, you talked about the idea of shame uh, in your introduction. Um, when you say, oh, you, when you tell, when Nobody in this space would ever do this, but some other people have done this. I heard, let's say they say to their spouse, you're so lazy, you're just not a good father, or you're just not a provider, you don't do anything. You're just never there for anyone. It's sort of expressing what you need, but it's not really sharing who you are. Saying, I really need you to be there for me more or I really need you to be more present with this child, leaves you vulnerable and open to being disappointed and to not getting what you want. If he doesn't respond to you in the first version, he just affirmed what he is, but he didn't really lose much. But when you share from that place of vulnerability, it actually leaves you open and wounded if you don't get what you need. You're kind of like calling out for connection and then you're left alone. So a lot of people choose to stay alone and don't actually express their needs from a place that actually allows for the other to give. When, when you come from a place of, I need this from you, as opposed to you're this or that in a negative way, it gives the other a chance to give. It also gives the other the chance not to give but it gives the other a chance to give. And it brings back that hope, that chance, that choice. Wait, this maybe could work. Maybe I can give to him what he needs. Maybe I can give to her what she needs. And the fear of, of, of disconnect, the shame of expression, the fear of not getting what you want, keeps people alone and not asking in a way that 
that gets them what they want. So I would say that's the second theme of a mistake. And there is the, a third one, which is very, very common. And it's people are different when, and they don't need to become the same in order to stay married in a happy way. In fact, in a good marriage, your differences are only honored and, and, and they, are, they play into the unit that works. So let's say if one parent is more disciplined with homework and at nighttime at bedtime and things are very regimented and the other parent is much more about connection and fun and come on, like let him just have some ice cream. Like he had a long day. Like let him have it before bedtime it's, uh, or before after homework. So, you know, when, when one of the spouses gets threatened by the, by the other one, and they want to kind of assert their selfness. No, no, we need to be disciplined. So they'll get more disciplined. And not only do they assert their selfness, but they need to diminish the other one in order for their self to, to be powerful. So they will diminish the other one one way or another, either directly or indirectly. And inside, they will not value what the other is bringing to the table. It's, I can only be a self if I diminish you. That is a very common mistake that I see. And I think that a good marriage takes a lot of humility and it takes the capacity to pause and to say, even though I don't, I don't understand where you're coming from and it's threatening me and it scares me to some degree, I need to ask what sense does it have in it? Where are you coming from? Let me understand what you mean by that or what, what, what in that makes sense. And then you end up respecting and seeing the sense in the other and ultimately respecting each other's differences and then even helping in, in each other's power. So that's kind of the more ideal version of, of it's building each other versus diminishing each other. Um, I would say that's the third most common mistake. I mean, there's, there, there are more, but I would say these three is the other to heal you, not expressing your needs in a way that, that can be responded to and diminishing versus building. Mm -hmm. I really can add one little piece. I'm not adding anything. I'm just sort of uh, speaking about one of the elements. <clears throat> Tomorrow you're talking about this idea of like vulnerability. Yes. And I think that we, we often lose sight of the fact that the definition of vulnerability is an acceptance that it might hurt more. Like it's not vulnerable unless it can really fail. And I think when you're thinking, if you put yourself in the mindset for a moment of a person who's really hurting one way or another, they're hurting. They're hurting because of the experience in the marriage or the experiences of the past or a collision of the two, whatever the, the reason might be. This individual is, is looking for some comfort. And in, in what we're asking someone to do in that state of mind is to kind of have faith that they could be vulnerable and the other is going to receive them. Yes. I think we just need to honor the fact that that is such a hard thing to do when you already feel so wounded and you already feel like you're walking into a space that you're not seen, you're not known, you're not valued for all the strengths that you've nurtured for throughout a lifetime. And then you're sort of, and I think we do this and all therapists do this. We kind of ask people, to, to really put themselves on the line, to be vulnerable, to share what's hurting them on the inside. And I think that in order to do that, we have to find a way to, to, to first hold ourselves, to literally hold ourselves and say, it's okay, we're walking into the unknown, we're walking into a new space and it's really frightening. And I might get more hurt, that's a real possibility, but I'm doing it because we do this once, um, we don't wanna to get too philosophical about it, but we have this opportunity once and we want to do it as well as we possibly can. And we don't want to live with fear. We don't want to live with regrets. We don't want to live with sadness. We want to live with an encounter of another, an encounter of ourselves. And I think we just need to hold on to this idea that for many people, and, and I'm not, I wish I could say for people on the other end of this, I'm talking about for all of us, we, we have these wounds that we carry. And those wounds make it really, really hard for us to lean into relationships, lean into the unknown with another. Um, yeah, we need to do it anyway. And I think that's, that's the idea we need to walk away with, that even though it's hard, even though there's a great risk in it, we need to do it anyway. Because by doing it anyway, it gives us a chance, it gives us hope, 
It restores us to our own sense of humanity, our own sense of self. And that's really what we're looking for. But we can't really take that leap of faith until we somehow find a way to embrace ourselves and say, like, we could do this. We're known enough and we feel safe enough that we could take the leap into the unknown. And it's in that space that we discover something new. And, but it doesn't always work out so well. I mean, right. you know that it doesn't always, every time we share, I had a client told me this once and it was such a deep, like a deep, like realization where he said, like the worst thing you ever told me was to be vulnerable. And I like was literally stopped in my tracks. I was hoping and, and praying on some way that through that act of vulnerability, it would open something up and turns out that the spouse used it as a way of punishing him right. further as opposed to embracing him more. Um, and that happens too. Um, so when we're vulnerable, we need to first hold ourselves. We need to understand what we're doing and the risk that comes along with it. Um, but we do it anyway, because the other side is much better than the side that we're in now, which is filled with a lack of understanding, a lack of comfort, a lack of joy, a lack of hope. And it's as a result of that, that we say, okay, let me jump into the fray. Um, and with the hopes that it might be a little bit better on the other side. Unbelievable. Beautiful. Okay, we have uh, quite a few questions. Let's jump into some live questions and uh, see where the night goes. Okay, you're on. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I am actually a Bachar. I'm not married yet, but seeing the polls, it actually triggered a thought, a question which made me think. Um, I had a hard time actually answering the, the polls because I'm not married, but the second question, which was the hardest part, the thing that I didn't, what, what one wouldn't realize, I voted, it just came to me imaginably that uh, what we bring from our past to our marriage, even though I'm not there, but it just, the thought came to me that that's what I could be in. I have had uh, different traumatic experiences, we could say maybe difficulties, and it's just uh, the imagination and I was never there. But the question is, first of all, as someone who's not married yet, what could we do before we get married to work on ourselves, you know? And second of all, this is just something I thought, you know, everyone, everyone has challenges. So, and everyone gets married, so everyone makes it. So this is kind of like, it's a, it's kind of a question on what was said, but it's also, it's also like, that's how life works. So how do we balance it? Like, we're never going to be fully perfect. So we're not going to get married till we we're, fully, we're fully conscious and balanced. So like, I don't know. My question is something along those lines. I'll take it. Well, first of all, my friend, my dear friend, hang tight and dig deep. And I so appreciate your presence, your vulnerability. And, and there's one thing that I heard in what you were saying, uh, which is the great ingredient for a good marriage, which is you're already thinking about it now. Um, and to be honest, I'll be really honest that when I walked into marriage, I didn't, I didn't have your mindset going into it. There was really a sense of like, I, I found the person I wanted to journey with for the rest of my life. And thank God we've been able to do that beautifully. Um, but I wasn't thinking about what, what am I really bringing into this space? What is really unresolved? What issues might really emerge in this space? So I just want to give you a lot of credit for thinking about those things at this moment. Um, but to think about marriage as, to think about being single as a time to like perfect yourself. There's one thing we need to know that when I was in yeshiva, let's say for many years, perfecting myself, doing the best I could to be with myself and to work on, to work on myself like everyone else does in those environments, yeshiva or seminary, um, or just life, um, that there's a limit. There's a limit to how much we could grow when we're only looking at ourselves. When you're in a relationship with another, inevitably you're going to see things that are different than what you were able to see prior to that moment. And the, it's like the other brings something out in yourself because now it's instead of you living well, just by your own being, you now need to live well in the presence of another, which is a lot more challenging than it is to do it by yourself. You know, to live on an island and to be okay on that island is okay. It's not the hardest thing in the world, but to live on an island where there's another person there and you're trying to navigate what do we do in this space? Um, it gets a little bit more complicated. And that's the beauty of marriage. Many people look at that as a sense of like, there's a hardship there. But when, when our mindset going into marriage is, I want this to be an opportunity for me to become the greatest version of myself. I want this to be an opportunity to, to face things that I may not have known existed already, but this is a vehicle by which I could become more whole as a person. 
and more perfected and, and bring more hope into the world. If that's our intention going into a marriage, then we embrace those challenges. And anyone who's gone through a marriage will tell you this, that the challenges ultimately for those who face them, they ultimately provide us with a much deeper meaning of ourselves and deeper sense of being with who we are. Um, and that's not because it's only blissful. It's because at times it's not blissful. And because it's not blissful, you have to encounter something new. And you then need to ask yourself, what do I do? Do I face it head on or do I run from this being? Do I run from myself or do I challenge myself to be present? And in that, with that mindset, you're set up for a life that is going to be filled with challenge because no one ever said it's not, but it's at least going to be meaningful. It's going to be meaningful and connected and beautiful. And uh, but to hear that in your voice today, I just want you to know you're years ahead of the game for you to know in advance that I understand that my challenges are going to make their way into this ma marriage and you're single. You're already you're already well ahead of most of us. And uh, kudos to you um, and, and embrace. Look forward to the future where you're going to encounter something new within yourself. And in that experience, you'll be deeply grateful for it. Um, yeah, we, we ask for these moments because it's these moments that bring us to like a deeper sense of self and satisfaction and, uh, and purpose and purpose in our lives. Do you have a thought on that, love? Beautiful. No, I, I love that point that he's already aware. And as you're speaking about this, I'm remembering one of my clients, actually, if, if she's on, she, she, she might recognize herself in this, but she, she knows I love her. Um, and I remember she had a tremendous history of trauma and she was very afraid to be a mother. And I remember she, it was like a text she sent me, like an emergency text. And I, and I thought that maybe something had come, come back up with the trauma work that we had done. And, and um, she was really frightened and she was expecting a baby at the time. And I called her. I was kind of alarmed myself and it brought up these, you know, what has come up for her. We had really done a lot of, she had done a lot of beautiful trauma work. And she said, like, Tamar, I'm really afraid I might not wake up for the baby in the middle of the night. Like that was her fear. And, but it was an honest fear. She said, I've never woken up for any of my younger siblings. And I really am a deep sleeper. And, you know, I was so, I chuckled. Um, um, and I let her hear my laugh because number one, I was so relieved. And number two, I knew that she'd wake up. And the reason I'm telling you this is because as the, as the baby's cry was more powerful for her as a mother than the sleep she needed, what I have seen in life and what I have seen from the people I've worked with is that love is more powerful than pain. And that our capacity to love and to want to give to the other is greater than the darknesses and the traumas. And it doesn't even make sense, but it works. If you trust in that purpose and that meaning and that hope, that it is somehow the healing and the love is more powerful than the pain. Oh, powerful stuff. Okay, we have another live question, you're on. Hi. Um... People often expect before getting married <clears throat> things that are, might not be practical. And when, when you get married, how do you move on from the past? Um, things that you thought that you wanted or that you might still want, um, move on from that and just be in a loving relationship without risking that you wouldn't get what you want and getting burned out from the marriage. Hmm. yeah no this is this is it this is the piece that you captured the the tension the tension of that fear of loss of self and and what does the unit need, need? and i would say you know like you were saying like knowing about yourself as you're going in a marriage makes you really decide what's important to you it makes you really have to choose and what are you willing to let go of and shed? And what are you not willing to shed? And what are you, what do you need to hold on to? I, I think that what's important there is that whatever you do, you do it with choice. You say, I am doing this because this will bring more connection and shedding this part or not having this, actually I'm okay with who I'm gonna become through it. And you know, I, I and this is not, 
this is not a pleasant thing to say, but in my understanding, that's, there is a reason why there's such a thing as a get, as a divorce. It's the only relationship that we, that is so intimate and close that we can choose to not be in. You know, even if, if a parent has a child that's difficult, that makes them have to question themselves and have to move to a different place because of a treatment that they need or because they, they, they can't go to work because the child needs them, they're almost like losing themselves to some degree, but they can't get out of that. They are still their parent. You are a parent no matter what the child brings to the table. But when it comes to a marriage, sometimes when it hurts the self so much that the self really can't exist in the space in a healthy way, and this is a complicated question of what that is, there is a choice of whether or not to be in it. The point that I'm making here is this point of whatever you do, decide about that, those parts, and then do it, do it from a place of giving, from a place of choice and leaning in, saying it's worth it for me. It's worth it for me for the connection. It's worth it for me to give to the other. And the other can help you with that. So when you focus on what you're losing, it hurts. And at any time we shed parts of us, even parts that are not good, even if it's better for us to get rid of them, it still hurts. This, we are attached to ourselves. This is how we are. But what could be helpful to you is when you really try and focus on the other and you think, what will that do for her if I do this? What joy will it bring her? What peace will it bring her? When you tap into your compassion for the other, it could help you let go of your parts and can even make that sweeter. It can make you feel more expansive. It can help you connect to the parts of you you didn't even know you had. You might not even realize how you like yourself better when you are, when you come from that place of compassion versus from that place of holding on. I don't know if that. It's almost like it, the, the question, the way I heard it was that whatever, whatever one walked in with the marriage, like whatever intentions they walked into the marriage with, and then they needed to let go of it. They need to give it up for whatever reason. Yes. The assumption of the question is that that's a bad thing. Right. And I think what I'm hearing and what you're saying is that sometimes, like when you give up something that shouldn't necessarily be there or that poses a challenge in that relationship, so long as it's not forced out of you and said it's a choice, a compassionate choice, then very often you're going to prefer that outcome. You're not going to walk in with a sense of now I gave up something and you, you walk around like someone took something from you. But instead, you walk around with a sense of I, I willingly, for the sake of deeper connection chose to give something up because it no longer was necessary in this stage it was no longer like important um and if you look at it from that point of view you're not giving anything up you're actually gaining something you're benefiting from something um so it's it's very much a matter of perspective but again sometimes you know when relationships ask us to give up too many parts of ourselves like we really need to reflect on that and say like how how healthy is that that there's all these demands that I can't really exist in that space. And that's something also to consider. But we need to know that giving up, and we know this even, you're talking about the analogy of, of a parent and a child. We give up our sleep to love our children. We, give, we work you know, beyond our capacity to provide for our children. Very few people would, would approach that situation as I gave something up. Instead, they look at it as I, I became something. I acquired something myself. I acquired adulthood. I acquired fatherhood. Um, and it's not a loss. Instead, it's a benefit. It's a gain. Um, so giving up is a complicated thing. It's not always giving up. Sometimes giving up is actually giving into something much more profound. And again, we don't quite know what's on the other side. We know what's on this side. Uh, but we don't quite know what's on the other side once we try something new. And that unknown is part of the scary part. Like, if I give this up, what will it be like? You know, it's that the unknown of that. That's the vulnerability and risk of that, of not knowing what's on the other side. But I can tell you that as much as giving up hurts, I think aloneness hurts more. And there is aloneness, even in a connected marriage, that those selves that we talked about. But I think that at the end of the day, I think aloneness hurts more than some parts of us that don't define us, that we would do okay without. 
Beautiful, Dr. Perlman. Doctor and Dr. Perlman. We can't hear you. Sorry. Next live question, you're on. Sorry. Okay, I think that's no. me. Oh. Yes. Which who? Which one? One second, one second, one second, one second. Okay, you're on. You're on. Male or female? There's two of us. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perlman. I want to bring from the, I want to talk about a taboo subject personality disorders, because I don't think that uh, some people could give in a marriage, but there are, you know, there are people with personality disorders, which make it very difficult. So I was married twice. My first wife developed a malignant brain tumor, died years ago, left me with three young children, and I raised them myself. My second wife, I believe, had a personality disorder. And so now in looking for a third marriage, I'm saying to myself, I Baruch Hashem have a very fulfilling I'm not lonely. I have a very fulfilling life, thank uh, Baruch Hashem. Uh, and how does one go about when you, even the first time, second time, or third time, or more, looking for someone and having the best chance that they, you know, that based on their traumas, my, you know, your traumas and various personality disorders that are out there, you know, it it, it is scary, as Dr. Perlman just said. I think that's really what what frightens me the most. And, and um, I'm just curious, how does, I mean, premarital counseling obviously is one option, but people resist that. But how does one deal with the possibility of a personality disorder or before marriage or in the marriage? You talk about communication and having somebody make you whole, all of that. Some people with their personality disorders, whether it's OCPD, borderline, uh, you know, uh, various other ones. I mean, you're the experts. To me, that is something that has it permeated the Jewish community and makes it very difficult. Well, I'm, I'm going to turn this over to my wife in a second, <laughs> um, but I, I do, uh, I do want to just say that that obviously some some real severe mental illness ex it exists across the board. It's not a Jewish problem; it's a human problem, and and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that everyone's beautiful. I just want to say this is a good opportunity to throw in a good word <laughs> that that's that even happening. even people with personality disorders, you know, <laughs> when we start paying attention to who they are and why they've needed to develop such a profound mechanism, a profound defense against, you know, living wholesomely with themselves, um, certainly living with others. Um, we're all doing our best. We're all trying our best. And and I, and what I've seen there's a devastation that's taken place. Um, where even even the APA, which is like the, the board of psychologists, and they're the ones who make like the big decisions, even they were trying to get rid of uh, the term borderline, because borderline basically places people in a prison. You know, once you're titled a borderline, that's it. No one wants to listen to you anymore. No one wants to give you a chance. Um, and I work with certain communities that the, the rates of borderline or what I would call so-called borderline are through the roof, well beyond statistical, you know, values in any other community. And that tells me something too. Um, so we need, to, we need to remind ourselves all the time that I've yet to really meet a person who isn't trying their best. And that is sometimes even in the chaos, they're still trying their best. Um, and it's something we just need to hold on to. I just want to say that before you said something a lot smarter than that. No, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's it. It's the idea of seeing the humanity in everyone. And uh, even when we feel like the other is disordered, so to speak, and seeing the humanity in them. Um, regarding your question, I, I, I hear and, and value the fear. And, um, and there is what to be afraid of. I understand that. And, you know, there are two things that come to mind um, besides what Akiva had just said. And um, one of them is that, you know, second marriages are often very much better than first ones. But often they're, but also um, more often than that, they are um, more, more destructive. And, you know, in, in your case, it's different because your, your first marriage had ended tragically with um, your wife's illness. Um, because a lot of the same patterns that played out in the first marriage played out again in the second marriage. And you would think, well, I just left one person that I escaped. What's happening? Why did I fall into another person that I need to escape? And I think what makes a second marriage successful or not is whether or not you feel empowered as a spouse going into it.
Because if you, if you understand what about the first marriage didn't work for you and what role you played in that, even if it was healthy for you to leave in, in good circumstances, that it was the right thing to not be in that marriage. You go into a second marriage feeling empowered and feeling, I know what to do. You know, and this was actually my study when I when I studied at, at um, Furkoff at Einstein for my doctorate, I actually studied what contributes to a successful marriage um, and what and one of, this, one of the questionnaires that I asked had to do with whether or not somebody feels lucky with who they married or whether or not they feel like they know what to do in their marriage to make it better. And what was interesting is that what was much more strongly correlated with a successful or more satisfied marriage was a sense of, I know what to do to make this better or to make this work, as opposed to, I feel lucky with who I married, meaning where the locus of control is on you and not on the other. So I would say is this piece of going into it empowered yourself saying, what do I have to bring to the table? How am I gonna be a good spouse? What, what is it that I know to do that I have learned from all these years of experience from good, from bad, that I can bring with, you know, into the marriage. And I think the, uh, the second piece I would say is, um, you know, I think you talk about this and uh, all the times the idea that if there is a place where you have the least amount of control, it's any place that has to do with connection. You know, if connection means that I, I, don't, I don't know what, well, how you're gonna respond to me. I don't even know when I take this risk, what's gonna happen. All I know is that I can take, I can choose whether or not take the risk and then connection may or may not happen. So I think part of what you're talking about, what I'm hearing is that fear of I'm going into this and if I go into this again I don't have much control as to what who is the other going to be and what's the other going to what's the other going to be to me and you're right you're right in many ways you don't have much control but you have impact and and in a place where there is least amount of control there is most possibility for real connection and intimacy that's what I'm beautiful. Okay, we have so many more live. Let's go. Let's try to knock them out. Okay. Hi. So, Hi. um, uh, my question is: So, my husband and I are relatively newly married. We just started having guests, and we both like it. He's more introverted, and I'm more extroverted. And his introvertedness can sometimes have like a negative feel, um, in the energy in the room and um the way he approaches the meal. Like he doesn't really small talk or ask people about themselves. Um, I want to use my bubbliness to boost the energy of the meal and help people feel comfortable, but I'm not sure how to do that in a sneeze way, uh, especially when the guests are men. And I also know I need to give him time and space to come into his own that he will hopefully warm up with time, but it can take a long time for him. And I don't want people to like not want to be our guests because it's uncomfortable. How do I balance these? <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> Well, I'm curious. I have two things, two risks I want to take. One is, I wonder if you could speak from the husband's perspective mm. of thinking like, you know, what do you think he would say? Right. And two is, I'm going to put you on the spot if you're okay with it. I am. I, you don't have to answer this. Mm -hmm. but, but while Akiva is speaking, if you want to think this through also, you should listen to him though, because I think that hearing what your husband is feeling, that I think that my husband would probably uh, be able to, to articulate, um, would be important to know in you know, you're picking up on what the other might feel. Um, but I want you to think about, if you were to think about one adjective, but only one, you can't give me two, of the <laughs> reason why you married your husband, and, and I think the more internal reason, like, uh, you know, something that has to do with who he is. What about him? What about him? What's the most core Nakuda that mm -hmm. attracted you to him? I want you to think about what that is. So, so you can think about that if okay. you don't mind. You want I already to have it if you want. Okay. Okay. I'll just share a little bit. I, I, this is a rule of thumb that everyone knows what the other the spouse is disappointed in. And we need to know this, that we're, we're always going to be some degree of disappointment to our spouse, one way or another, it doesn't matter 
we come, came from and how wonderful the marriage is. There's always going to be something that the spouse wants of us to be, to become, that the other simply may not be. Um, and to be on the receiving end of that, one way, or the, one way or another, to be on the receiving end of a disappointed spouse, where let's say your husband's a quieter guy, and he's just more internal, more introverted. He doesn't have a loud voice. And that's who he is. That's, that's the essence of his being. Um, and he certainly, I imagine, I'm just presuming a few things based on the way you asked the question. I imagine he knows the appointment that you have in him. Um, and as a result of that, think about what, what, what must be running through his mind as he's sitting at a table next to you, beside you, you know, sort of trying to, you know, vacillating between, I can't believe I'm such an idiot. How come I can't get this right? And why am I so quiet? And what's wrong with me? And why did I, why am I like my father who was also quiet and my mother was disappointed in him? Um, that, and also vacillating between that and a sense of rage as to like, why is it so important for my wife to be something different than what I am? Why does she need me to be her father? I'm not her father, or I'm not her brother, or I'm not her. Why does she need me to be that? Why can't she just respect and accept who I am? Um, because that's really what we're all looking for. Um, we're looking for like some form of affirmation from the other, that we like who you are. We like your intentions. You may not get it right all the time, but we like what you're trying to be and who you're trying to be. And I would imagine, I don't why my wife asked me to give the male perspective for a second, because it, 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 I would imagine that your husband deeply knows um, how you feel about him towards him, not to say anything negative about your own hurt in this, because clearly you're hurting. You're saying, I want a certain home. I want a certain environment. And for whatever reason, the man that I married doesn't seem to be capable of providing you with that. And that's a very painful thing to live with. Um, and I'm not going to compare the pains. I'm not going to say one is greater than the next because they're both valid. They're both meaningful. But let us for a moment consider um, what is it like to somehow convey disappointment to the other. And we have to acknowledge and accept that we are conveying that disappointment to another. If we're disappointed in our spouse, the spouse knows that. And whether or not we've ever said anything, they simply know that. Um, so to, to me to think about how is there, you know, for your journey, I'm gonna to leave to my wife, but I'm just focusing on that part. I imagine for him, he would need to comfort himself a great deal to say, even though you're not very good at this, you have other things that you're probably good at and survive this meal and tomorrow's another day. Um, I imagine okay. that journey, um, but also to, to do what he can to rise to the occasion for you. That's also a part of his journey. It's not like that's not a critical element, um, but always to think about, you know, how disappointment plays out in a marriage. And it's deeply painful. It's a deeply painful process. Yeah, so um, part of, so I guess answering your, or your first thing about like the trait that attracted me is that he has this genuine goodness, but then an alternative, like a piece of information to add to this, that a lot of his introvertedness or closed offness comes from some difficulty with relationships that he experienced growing up, that he's worked on himself a lot in order to be married, but it hasn't extended to other people outside of our marriage yet, where like he's afraid to get close and connected to them. And that's why there's that closed off not asking them more about it and so that's where I have a hard time accepting him as he is because I feel like at some point he was this open guy and he could be open again um but he does also express that he wants me to accept him how he is so I'm trying to balance like how can I encourage him how can I ask him as a positive need to how to present himself at a meal in a more friendly way like if I say oh ask people questions it's not gonna you know you know I, I think that if you tap into like I I knew that we needed to get in like your con you know when you can tap into his experience that it's not for free to always be disappointed. There are losses in it, you know, and, I, and once, we can, once we can see the tenderness of that, once we can notice how sacred that space is, then we can say, you just gave the answer, how to positively express it, to tell him what you do need as opposed to what's missing for you. And this way it gives him a chance to give to you. It gives him a chance to please you because like, like Kiri was saying, like, that's all he wants to do. He wants to not be disappointing. So to, if you can <clears throat> tap into the sense, and that's why I thought that talking about his humanity before we give anything else, that needs to be the grounding. You seeing him and how this is, how he's gonna receive this needs to be the foundation. 
And then you express your need and in a way that he can respond to, that empowers him to respond to. And I bet you that part of his goodness that you said, his genuine goodness has something to do with his quiet, has something to do with his, with his internalness. It's the very thing that also attracted you to him is also in this. I was meeting with a couple recently and the wife was disappointed in, in the amount that he learned, you know, outside of yeshiva or outside of a structure. And she very much cares for him and, and admires who he is as a person, but would prefer that he learns more. And when they were talking about just sort of speaking about it together, when, he, when and I asked him, I said, okay, let's play this out. And, sh and she would share, I'm really disappointed in that. And I would turn to him and say, okay, well, what, what, what feelings do you have at this moment when you hear that? And his response was like rage and, and rejection. Um, and I said, how could you hear this differently? What would that look like? And he said, it's not like I don't want to learn. He said, I do want to learn. But I wanted to come from a, a, a more meaningful part of myself. I wanted to come from not from shame, but from desire. Um, so that was the journey that the two of them are on at this point, saying, okay, how could we express this, but without a sense of disappointment, rather a sense of desire. Um, and that, I do believe, will very much transform their relationship in this dynamic. Yes, I love that. I love that. Like the idea of eliciting desire as opposed to eliciting shame. Yeah, because like we said, we're all wonderful. Like we're all trying our best and we're all as good as we could possibly be at that particular moment. And that's all that's ever asked of us. Um, and uh, so someone's trying, we're all trying to, to do our, our best and our part. Uh, and we're not, when we're not doing it well, we're disappointed in ourselves yes. the, same, the same way others are disappointed. Yes, yes. And, you know, wives are always surprised how the husbands end up crying on like the second or third session in couples therapy. They're like, what, you had tears in you? Like, I didn't even know you knew how to cry. And, you know, I think that those are usually sad moments for me because I see how much they're missing each other and how much of his pain is not present in the relationship and how much of his goodness is not noticed and how much of her frustration is not being translated into him responding, you know, and, and I, I love that line of eliciting desire versus shame. I came up with it. I'm super excited. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Let's go to the next live question. You're on. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wonder, I wonder, like, when is the time you put the feet down? Like, what is worth it to fight for? And what should we give in? Like you said earlier, like, there's certain things, like, you have to be comparable and certain things you don't have to be comparable. So when do we put our feet down and when don't we do that? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to, I think, I think Tamar would probably have a clear answer to this, you know, to sort of create a set of rules um, as to like what constitutes like staying and not. And, and I think it's a very, it's a very painful question. It's a deep question and, and often will lead into the dialogue of when does one make a decision to stay or, or to go? Um, and again, and now the profound wisdom of our, of our guide, of our Torah, like there's room for that. There's space for saying, you know, this doesn't work for us. This doesn't work for me. There's space even just for that. Yes. Um, and I, it, to me, when someone's in a state of danger, when someone's in being harmed and someone's being hurt and someone's being belittled constantly, to me, these are, are signs that there, there isn't even an intent to make it better. When someone's literally being abused emotionally or physically, um, these are to me lines that can never be crossed in a relationship. We could, people could struggle, people are entitled to struggle, but they're not entitled to hurt one another. Sometimes our expression of pain ends up being hurtful to another, but often that's not a, the, it's intent. It's just an expression of pain that is hurtful for the other to hear. But when there's an act of direct desire to harm another, um, or, or to diminish and belittle another, that to me is when you cross over that line and it's no longer we're on the same playing field and working together towards something, that to me constitutes it's simply not okay. That's my, you know, my thought on it. Yeah, it's, yeah, I, it's, it's like you said, it's a painful question. It's a hard one to answer. You know, I, I thought that this, this question comes up almost every time I sp speak about marriage 
And, you know, as much as I try to define and find, how do you define it? Like you said, it's hard to know where the lines are. But I would say that some basic human needs of respect, it's complicated, right? Because in any relationship, there's gonna be this respect. Like you said, there's gonna be hurt. There's even gonna be some manipulation. There's even gonna be some, some um, hurting each other and, like, and thinking you could have avoided that. But when someone's basic needs of safety, of privacy, and of, uh, of the tolerance of just having a self, if that's not tolerated, then that's where the question starts to come in. You know, I treat a couple that I see as an abusive couple very differently than I treat a couple that I don't identify as abusive. I used to, I used to see things in a more equal way, and I and I no longer do that after years of experience. I I don't give equal ground to the abuser and to the victim. Um, and what I, tr- but I do usually give equal ground, so to speak. And sometimes one needs to step up a little bit faster and a little bit stronger than the other when it comes to other couples work. But what I try to bring into that kind of a relationship or when I'm speaking to somebody that I think is in an abusive relationship is again, to bring them to a place of empowerment, of having them see and be able to answer that very question Am I, am I okay here? Am I safe here? Do I want this? Is this, or is this, is this really, really not safe for me? Is this really, really dishonoring me at the core? Um, It's really kind of diminishing me and erasing me as a human. I try to help them get to a place where they know the answer to that. That's what I would say. Remember last time when we spoke, I think it was last, last time you were on, so when the person loses themselves as their essence, who they are, yes, one of the big warning signs, you know. Okay, if it's is it okay, um, Akiva? Question for you. Sure. Somebody said that it's pretty much we discussed it before. If we can maybe break it down a little bit, I had an extremely hard upbringing. My parents were always fighting. Finally, they got divorced, and the battle never ended. I'm ready to start dating. My question is, how does trauma affect one's role in relationship? I guess to break it down, make it more practical, to understand what he's bringing along into right. the relationship. Yeah, it's a beautiful question, a painful question. I think that, you know, we, we throw around this word trauma a lot. And I think it's almost like losing its charge because it's so overused at this now, point. Sometimes my, sometimes my children, when they need to get lunch to school, they say like, oh my gosh, I was so traumatized, I didn't have lunch. I'm like, whoa, whoa, well, that's lunch. Yeah, my, uh, one of my children, I think he wanted something in particular, I forget what it was. And he invited me into a session, which was wonderful. And he started sharing with me, you know, I'm, you know, I'm traumatized. And I think the conclusion was, I don't play enough we or something like that. Yes. Um, and I, uh, Yes, he like pretended to be in session 10 years later <laughs> of what this would look like if we don't give him what he wants. All, right. All my friends played we, and they're going to reflect yes. on that, and I didn't. I think How we're really the session? How much was the session? Okay. I think many people don't even know what we is. I, I think that's a problem. <laughs> Either way, um, the, but what, to, to take away the word trauma for just a second um, and talk about what it means to grow up in an environment that's filled with chaos, where one is really not allowed to develop a, a strong, empowered sense of self. Um, we could call this trauma, and that's, that's really generally how we would define trauma. But let's talk about it from a more humane perspective, which is what happens to these people? Who are these people and what ultimately becomes their journey? And when, when a person is not nurtured in a way where they have a, a real developed sense of self, um, they're left questioning virtually every part of their being. Like, am I an acceptable, am I an acceptable person? And they're looking for all that validation on the outside as opposed to the inside because they don't really have a reservoir that is filled with enough love and care and protection that allows them to make their way through the world without a sense of fear. So traumatized individuals, people who are walking around very hurt, they ultimately seek solace in the relationships around them. And when you look at the works of uh, Gabor Mate, and he looks a lot at the world of trauma, 
he talks he defines a traumatized person um as like in the realm of hungry ghosts so he's referring to whatever old deities that have like they have these big stomachs and they're constantly eating but they never get satiated they never get filled and i think when a person is walking around with a sense of i'm not full i'm not good enough who i am as a person is not acceptable enough for myself and the world around me it's this insatiable belly it's this insatiable emotional need that they're sort of walking around with and their sense of yearning and craving for it to be completed and and made to feel whole again and i think many of us on on even on a small level could relate to this idea but some of us on a profound level like that question um, where it's not just a little thing, it's their entirety, their whole essence is one that is fragile and hurt. So when that person, imagine that individual walking into a relationship, an intimate relationship, one where they're going to be seen on every level in every regard, and they don't have enough of a foundation. So that person is walking in and basically like a, a blade of grass in the wind, they could go in any direction, depending on where the person wants to place them. Um, so they are vulnerable, they are fragile, um, and they're hurting, and they'll place demands on the relationship for it to be comforting towards them in a way that, generally speaking, another cannot really satisfy. Yet they're seeking the other to satisfy it. They want them to satisfy it. They crave that satisfaction and that validation, but they don't seemingly get it. So when we talk about coming into a relationship with pain and what that does to the relationship. Essentially, it defines the relationship. The relationship becomes defined by, am I attending to the needs of this person or, or am I forsaking the needs of this person? Um, and, and another, it often takes them some time to realize what's really happening with, with, with their spouse, who is really struggling on a profound level. Um, and this is a person we're talking about before that they're often looking for the other to make them feel whole. And in reality, what they really need to be doing is looking, looking towards themselves, looking inwardly to create a sense of wholeness with their, with their own being, with their own sense of self. Um, and very often people aren't doing that. They're just looking for the other to heal it. Uh, and that's what creates a lot of the, the fractures in relationships. Um, and a person who's hurting, they need to ultimately acknowledge that. And I think just to, you know, you define me a little bit as the vulnerable man. Uh, and I think it is something that I, I try to do as much as I can, uh, but without embarrassing my wife in any way. Like, I think this is honestly the greatest gift that she has given to me, because I think there were some things I walked into the relationship with, with a belief that no one would be able to really hold it and contain it and be OK with it, with the need that it just I, I'm going to have to bear with this and, and to see. And uh, this is this is a thank you and an acknowledgement, which mm -hmm. I do many other times, not only over here in front of hundreds of people, um, but to be to be seen and to be given that gift of I can tolerate even the 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 parts of you that are not whole and not complete is probably the greatest gift you've ever given me. Mm. Um, and and it's not something I ever believed I would get. That's the honest truth. I thought it was something I'd have to live much of my life without ever you know, completing and feeling whole in. And, uh, and that's a gift. It's a gift that, that, that continues to be given mm -hmm. in a very, very profound way. But without that, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be able to do my own inner work, which is what I need to do. Um, and which is what we all need to do. Um, Cause marriage is a vehicle, but we need to be in the driver's seat to say, where would I like it to go? How would I like it to be? And that's a personal decision. Right. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, question? no, thank you. I, when you said without embarrassing my wife, mm. I got very scared and I thought maybe don't say this. <laughs> maybe yeah. catch yourself before you say it. But as you were saying it, I was thinking it has, you know, parts of that were surprising to me and I didn't know that I would be able to do either. But I think what was also surprising to me is, is like what I was saying before that love is really more powerful than pain. And it's even bigger than yourself. Like you don't even know you have all that in you when you are, when you notice and focus in on the other. And it has also been a gift for me because it allowed me to kind of face myself and have to do work with my own self that I, I would have never done. And it had expanded me and my, and who I am and my capacity uh, besides obviously the connection and the ability to give to you. So I think that when we do take those risks, um, it really 
ends up benefiting us a lot of the time, you know, and, um, and you end up, you end up growing, expanding, and also connecting. Yeah. I mean, thanks, love. <laughs> <laughs> okay, beautiful. Listen, there's nothing better than group therapy here. We do it all together. <laughs> Next live question, you're on. Hi, I'm Beverly. Um, I had two things I wanted to say. One thing, addressing the young man that was looking in the future, he was not married and he was looking in the future and he was talking about therapy for himself and things like that. And I just wanted to say at some point you get to a block and you do need another person to help you to grow because I've done a lot of therapy on myself and you, it, it gets to a point that you can't go forward. You can keep learning, but you can't keep doing until there's someone in your life. I am single, but I wanted, the real question was, um, what if you have two people, one uh, is a communicator, the female is a communicator, the husband is not a communicator, he's basically quiet from trauma, uh, from his childhood, how do those two people, uh, how do they work things out, if, you know, if one is left uh, making decisions because there's no communication and the other one is living in their head. How, how does that work? Well, uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge what you were saying before and I, I um, the, of your thoughtfulness in, in responding to the younger man that had spoken before. And in your saying that in some ways we grow better together, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I think that's a really honorable, honorable thing for you to say. And, and I, I really respect that and agree with that. Um, regarding different communicators, I think in relationships, we always communicate. Mm -hmm. We just communicate differently. And I think the, the art of the relationship becomes to be able to hear the other, even when the other's language is different than yours. Mm -hmm. um, I find that trying to have your spouse communicate the way you want is more about hearing what you want as opposed to really listening to what the other has to say. Mm. They pause. You will see that the other is talking and maybe quieter, maybe less, maybe using less eloquent words, but there is, there is always communication. The, the question is whether or not there is listening and hearing, but communication is always there. The sound of silence. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's a lot significantly louder than the spoken word. Yes. And, uh, and the retreat is also a form of communication. You know, someone going into their shell out of fear or out of, out of rage, they're letting you know that that's how I feel, that's how I'm responding. Um, and that also, that also is a form of communication. It may be different, uh, but it's still a form of communication. I think often, you know, couples therapy is really helpful in this type of dynamic that yes. you're talking about, because it really, it really provides the forum for people to understand communication styles and understand that we all feel, we all think, we're all responding, but we have a different way of expressing that to one another. Yeah, I yeah, I often have a couple come in and one will complain that the other one doesn't say anything and the other one will say a lot. And the one that complained about that, like completely misses it emotionally. You know, you know, he'll say like, oh, and very quickly. And this was embarrassing at work. And um, and she'll just like five minutes later, complain about how he doesn't share anything. And I, and I see how she just missed that or how he just missed that. And um, I think sometimes it's like noticing the spaces in between and noticing, just noticing. And also creating space where it's safer for the other to share more. As opposed to making him share more, it's asking the question of what is it that will invite you to want to share more? Okay, beautiful. Let's go to the next live question. You're on. Hi. Um, so I recently got married and um, I 
never like like when I was single I was never really like this but when I got married I guess it brought it out more but I started feeling a need to like control a lot like control like every aspect of my life like every aspect of my husband's life my life and it's just like as much as like I try not to I like and I know how it's gonna be at the end a bad result and I know how it's not gonna turn out good if I try to control his life and stuff and if I try to make sure everything's perfect but I'm so scared of letting go of that control because I'm scared of let's say if I don't do this my life would be so much worse so like <laughs> I, I guess I did have a little bit of trauma when I was younger and stuff and in my past of growing up and stuff in my family but I'm not sure if that's like a cause for I don't know what it is exactly but just now I just I know it's like sometimes gets a little bit like intense because like I'm trying so hard like not to do it but then if I don't do it I feel like it's going to be so much worse if I don't control everything and it's just going to be like everything's going to be so bad and I if, but if I control okay at least I know the outcome of everything but I I don't want to live like that because I know it's not good so yeah I'm just yeah <laughs> I think you should. Yeah. The, um, it's amazing hearing you and so much awareness that you have um, about the dynamic that's taking place. Um, and it's really, really brave. That's the honest truth. Um, to acknowledge, to notice. And I think many of us notice this, but we, very few of us have the bravery that you have in saying, saying this out loud and knowing it well enough that we could acknowledge it to ourselves. Um, Again, I, I, I don't want to get into any form of analysis mode, but it, it, it's clear, it seems clear from your question that there's a, there's a fear of letting go of control um, because at that moment, you're going to be left in a state of unknown and you're not quite sure what the outcome is going to be, which you very eloquently stated. Um, and to me, that's, that, that is probably the likely journey you're going to have to take. The question becomes when? and how and under what circumstances. Um, but there's a terrible fear in letting go, but also a terrible freedom, a beautiful freedom, sorry, in being able to let go um, and say, okay, I can't predict the outcome of this, but it, at least I'll be present with it. At least I know that I gave it my all and I tried to let go. But number one, I just wanna say before you even attempt to do that, make sure it's safe. For you to let go make sure it's safe for you to not control because sometimes we control out of you know a form of protection um, but once you determine that it is safe um, then i think it'll be a beautiful encounter it's a great opportunity for a walk in the park and say you know i noticed this about myself and i noticed that it's something i'm doing and i i don't want to do it i feel compelled to do it and i don't quite understand yet why i do it but i understand that i am um, and it's something that I, I know is hurtful to you and it's something that I know is hurtful to me and it's something we, I would like to work on and let's try to find a way to do that. I imagine in that moment the relief that would emerge from both yourself and from your spouse would be profound um, and it's a beautiful journey. You know when we talk a lot about marriage being an opportunity for growth this is precisely what we're talking about. You know you encountered the new self, it emerged and now you're gonna have to learn about why it's important to you um and and why it could be harmful to another um and that's the beauty of of this whole process and and just be your yours manifested in a form of control um but but for the rest of us it manifests in a different way so just know you're not alone in the fact that things emerge in marriage but but you're still gonna have to face this alone for you and your spouse together um, but the fact that you're aware of what's happening is the key to all of this. You know, that's what gives us the courage to move forward. And I'm just really, I'm inspired and in awe of your strength. And you should, you know, Shem should continue to give you strength to continue to move forward in a beautiful way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with all of that. And I, I feel that tremendous respect for, for your awareness and your courage to share it. And also in that, I'm hearing you're, 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 you're ready, you're ready, you're ready letting go to some degree, because you're looking at this control and you're saying it's in the way of something. And, and I just, I, I want you to know, as I hear you, 
I see that you can have a very beautiful marriage because it's in these very spaces that you repair that you're going to have the most connection and you're going to feel it and you're going to really experience joy and freedom like you're staying in it. Um, and I, I wish you a tremendous atzlacha in it. Hashem helps you in that process. I want you to know that, that you're not alone in that. Not only in that everyone encounters themselves in some way, most with less awareness than you. But Hashem wants you to be able to give and let go of parts of you. This is not a part you would have known had you not gotten married, most likely. And he's, he's with you in this journey of letting go. And he's protecting you also. And he wants you to have connection um, and healing, you know, personal healing and connection with the other. And I wish you, we wish you atzlacha. Yeah, beautiful. Let's get into some more questions over that came in. Um, my spouse did something that's very hard to forgive, whatever it is, you know, let's globalize it. Is forgiveness possible and is it necessary in a marriage? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, should be. I mean, it's you got this. It's a, <laughs> you know, in, in many ways, like I, I see a success relationship and it's not in its avoidance of mistakes but in its ability to repair the more a couple is able to repair when hurt happens the better off they're going to be because everyone hurts each other and everyone needs to ask for forgiveness in some way or another so the ability to repair i think is one of the most powerful powerful tools and, and, you know, signs in having a relationship that's safe and forgiveness is a, is a very interesting idea because it's something that happened in the past and you are kind of acknowledging a hurt that happened in the past and you're saying, I'm accepting it. So what does that mean? And um, <clears throat> I think that repairs cannot happen without forgiveness because you are saying, I am okay, I'm an accepting something that you did that hurt me. And I'm okay with that not being perfect. And I think in that two big things are happening, you touched on this a lot, is I think that you are accepting the other as imperfect and that the other will, will hurt you and the other will um, sometimes get but you accept it and you're going to give it another chance and you're going to continue to give it a chance. And hopefully next time it's going to be less pain and it's going to be a bit closer to what you want. And in it, you're also kind of accepting yourself and that you're also broken and that you will also hurt. And you also need to sometimes be forgiven. So I would say that if there, if there isn't forgiveness in a relationship, that means there aren't repairs. And if there aren't repairs, that means there is avoidance. And that means there isn't enough connection. And I would say the places where couples hurt each other the most, when they're repaired well, those are the places where that brings them closest yeah. to Like this, the, the most hurt spaces end up being the most potential for connection. You see this all the time. I'm sure you can think about your own lives and you can see that. When you repair something, when you get over something, when you work through it, that really, it, it elicits something new between the two of you. It renews your marriage. It's something new that you know about each other now. You rediscovered each other. You celebrate something new together. And it's a real renewal and it's a real reconnection and a realignment with each other. I've always appreciated this one line uh, Esther Perel said. She said that there are several relationships that people might have throughout the course of their life. And when, then there, when there's a moment that there's a real fracture, there's something that's unimaginable and it, yes. the pain is just too profound. You know, she says with that, to sit down with that couple and say, I want you to know that that marriage, that relationship that you had is over. Yes. You now need to ask yourselves, are you willing to try another marriage with one another? <laughs> which to me is the process of repair. And when there's a will, when there's a desire, um, some of those moments are of the most beautiful that you'll ever encounter. Um, I have an office, we share an office, and 
But there are some moments there that were so beautiful that I, I literally don't want to move even to another office in the building because they simply they have meaning to me. Um, because I was there in a moment, I'm sure my wife could say the same, where people rose to places that I never believed were really imaginable. Um, they, 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 they just rose to levels that were beyond themselves, that seemed like but beyond human. Um, and in, all in order to repair something that, was, that caused profound pain in their relationship. Um, and most of them, many of them will, will report later that this marriage, even though they're the same people, in the same relationship was significantly better than the one that existed where they didn't know how to communicate well enough for that fracture to not occur. Yeah. Um, and we learn, we learn from our mistakes. We're, we're all going to make them, but how do we respond to them? That's what defines us. And it's easier to not forgive. In a way you get to stay in, in yourself and in your own dignity and your own, in your own righteousness. And, and it's an effort, like you said, the desire. There needs to be humility and desire there because forgiveness takes some self, some self be tool, like some, some questioning of self, some letting go again, you know, and it's, it's, it's easier not to, but it's, but it's better when you do it right. And it's, it's better when you do. Yeah. I think people who know how to forgive are simple. We're all wonderful. <laughs> people who know how to forgive are just you think so? Yeah, they are. No? Uh, they live better lives. Okay. Somebody, with somebody who came on the share and he explained in depth what is forgiving, you're really, you're really giving to yourself. For giving, forgiving yourself is giving for yourself. Without forgiving, you can't give. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, Asher. Nachum, remember the Dali Fenster? It was great. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next live question. We're going to unmute them. Okay. this back. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> um, what about if it's a small little thing and you forgive them and they keep doing it again and again and again, even though it's small, but it's so repetitive that eventually you kind of, you, if you forgive, then it really, you're, you're almost being a fool because you know, it's going to happen again. So you lose trust and the, the, the offerance of uh, forgiveness no longer has any meaning. Mm. You're definitely, there are probably 700 people that are nodding their heads right now, as you're mm -hmm. saying. And they're, oh, good that she asked it because we wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know, you know I, I wrote a word down. Um, I don't know if you agree with this word or not. Let's give it a go. Um, that sometimes it's not about forgiveness and it's about especially and it's it's again it's a it's an acceptance with choice. And I think you can ask yourself, is he trying his best? And if especially if the answer to that is yes, then I think it brings acceptance into the picture of just accepting the other in their imperfection. And they're trying their best, but it's still not this, this small thing that bothers me is still repeating. If they're not trying their best, that's where it gets more complicated because then it's not about the small thing, but it's about you feeling like what matters to you matters to him. Then you ask, does he care about what I care about? Why is he not trying his best? So I think that it becomes about does, does he care about me? Does he care about what matters to me? So every time that small thing happens, that feeling can come up. If you can talk about that feeling as opposed to the thing that's happening, then it could be that it's gonna give your spouse more of a desire to respond to that. Um, you know, when, when in, in couples therapy, I almost never talk about things and, you know, um, technical things. Um, and you could see how, how impractical what we're saying. It's all emotion and theory because ultimately that's where a relationship really lives. It's about what it brings up for you. And, you know, like you said, when you pause the spouse and you say, when she's disappointed in you, what does it bring up for you? That's where he lives. He's not in the question of uh, hours of learning. 
for her. He's in the question of what, what does this feel like for me? So if you can share from a place of emotion as to what something means to you, maybe you'll get into a different plane and into a different space with this topic. And then if you could see that he's trying his best, then at that point there is acceptance in that he's imperfect, we are all imperfect, and some things won't change. And is it okay? Can you, can you live with this being the case? Can you still build with him? Can you still love him and receive from him? What would you say to that? I like that word. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes people don't know how to say this, but sometimes people disagree with one another, which might be what you're talking about, that someone repeatedly does the same thing because even though they may know deep down that it hurts, that they simply don't know how to provide that because it violates some belief or violates some sense of self. Um, and again, we all need to be conscientious of, of how ourselves is impacting the other. Uh, but sometimes we need that acceptance because it's, it's nearly impossible to find any other human being that you'd have like be in absolute agreement with virtually everything that comes your way uh, that doesn't really exist. Um, so we're then left with, do we work on perfecting it and become and rising to the occasion? And if not, do we then work on acceptance, not as like a shortcoming of the relationship, but actually as a form of strength that, that I understand that there's difference. Again, when it's personal and someone's hurting one, you know, deliberately, that's a very, you know, that's a different story. But very often this question kind of comes up when people just have differences with one another and they don't want to face those differences. So instead it turns into a disappointment yes. um, as opposed to it just simply being a different perspective. Um, and then acceptance becomes a necessary integral part. And, and like we said before, acceptance and forgiveness, these are beautiful traits, you know, to, to have with, with a spouse, with a child, even with a parent. Um, learning to accept that when we get, we get, you know, one of the better stages of therapy or even forget about therapy, just of life is when we get to a place where we learn to accept that our parents themselves also tried their best. And even in their best, they might've still hurt, um, but they're still trying their best. And that's a form of acceptance that we have to even the pain that's come in our direction. Um, so yeah. it's a critical piece of life. Like you made me think of two more things as you're saying is one is, like, you know, what you're saying now is that the acceptance might give you more than the thing that you're trying to fix. You're, you're going to be more expanded in your capacity to accept. And yourself, your children, other people in your life, it, it's going to expand your capacity to accept. But also, as you were talking about the other, just like I was saying before, what does this mean for you? Maybe understanding better, what does this mean to him? Why does he repeat it? Where is it coming from in him? Is it, you know, maybe there is more to it. Maybe there is a reason to understand, to understand him in it better. Maybe that would be helpful. Okay, let's jump into a few more questions before we go to the end over here. Um, I have a general question. When a couple is married to each other, how honest do you have to be with one another? Meaning, do you tell the spouse everything, even things that will affect the relationship when I could just simply be quiet to avoid the fighting? How open do you have to be? I think this is your question. I think I just asked my husband, do you want to start with this one? And he said he was honest and said no. I yeah. don't <laughs> you know it, it, it's a good question and we've been talking about this throughout that without you know I have I have often worked with a couple and I will say I will say to let's say I'm working with the wife and I will say to her did you share with him what that meant to you when he said that um, he, you know, he demanded something of you or he didn't acknowledge something in you. And, and she would say, no, I, I don't want to share with him. I'm scared. I'm scared he's going to be angry at me. I'm scared he's going to, I'm scared he's going to um, withdraw. I'm scared he's going to, you know, find me, find, find me petty, you know, and, and I, and that space is a space that's space of shame and fear and sometimes well-founded because the other doesn't give doesn't give her let's say uh, safety that he'll respond well and she's had experiences with him where she shared and he responded with rage and withdrawal but as long as you remain in that space then 
it's that it's that soil that's dry. It has no opportunity to grow because then the spouse never really knows what you need. You need to give direction to the other as to what the marriage needs. And when you quiet yourself and mute yourself to a point where the other doesn't know what you need, then the it's like the marriage loses direction. The marriage loses life. It becomes lifeless. And there is no opportunity for connection. There's no opportunity for the other to actually give you what you need and for you to receive it. On the other hand, there's such a thing I think as like selfish honesty, if there, where you kind of, you know, throw on the other what you don't wanna hold without recognizing what it will be like for the other to, to be thrown at with this information. I think that I think that honesty in a relationship needs to be relational. It needs to be multidirectional. It's not a, just about your expression. It's also about the other and how the other will receive it. And I think considering what the other's experience will be like is an important piece in, in whatever it is that you share. So I don't know if this is a frustrating answer in that I'm saying yes, you need to be honest to give direction and to have connection, but also you need to be honest with yourself as to whether or not will this bring more connection or is this me throwing myself in a way of, of um, you know, trying to get something that I'm supposed to do on my own. What do you think about that? I agree 100%, like period, meaning obviously we all want, um, the, the relationship is much better off with absolute honesty. There's no question about that. And that's what we're striving for. But we also, I've seen many, many situations where people were being brutally honest, but really not for the sake of the relationship. It was right. much more about dispelling their own guilt, their own shame, their own frustration. And it really didn't account for how the other is going to receive that. Um, and that isn't necessarily the best time to do such a thing like that. It's the best mechanism, the best way to move forward, but it's not the best time to do it. Um, so until you know that I'm doing this for the sake of the relationship, honesty is not always the best policy. Sometimes that is just your own shame emerging and you need to dispel that. Yes. Um, so honesty is the best policy, but timing is a real critical factor. Yes. That's what I think. Yes. Okay, the, back to Perlman's. Let's take the last question of the night and then maybe we'll do one more question and then we'll go to closing. Just so many people want to ask so many questions over here. Okay, the last one is a special guest. Here we go. I'm you. Hello, Dr. and Dr. Perlman. It is nice to see you guys. What's up, brother? How are you? Oh, Baruch Hashem. So I have a question. Being that you guys are therapists and you're in a marriage together, how do you find that? Do you find that if you have all the skills, then it avoids all the fights? Or are there still disagreements? Is there still adjustments? Does it help the process? Or do you sometimes tell each other, like, don't speak to me therapy language, and now let's just have a real fight? How does it go? It goes wonderfully, as you There's, could imagine. Right. It's, it's perfect. The, no, what did, the second thing you said, the no disagreements and just, right? I think that your think husband gets the last word. He says, yes, dear, whatever you said is correct. Is that how it goes? Like in a classic Jewish home or. I think like, our kids say this to us all the way. Like, are you being, are you, why are you talking therapy to me? <laughs> you know, that our kids say that to us all the time. Yeah. There's, there's this very strange assumption. When you think about like, what are the skills to become a therapist? I'm not speaking about the humanity. I'm talking about the basic skill. Really the basic skills are, you need to go to graduate school and know how to write papers. And then if you successfully write those papers, you become a therapist, that's it. Now, what, what it takes to become uh, an impactful therapist, I think is very different. But the reality is that being a therapist does not necessarily mean that you're healthier than anybody else. That is something that we're all, we're, we're all tested, whether or not we've gone to school, whether or not we work with others, uh, whatever role you're in, humanity is humanity. Facing yourself as a person is a challenge. And that doesn't, it doesn't necessarily make its way into the world of knowledge. Um, we spend our lives gratefully, you know, in this, a great deal of in the service of others, as you do, Mordechai. 
Um, and there's no question that if you're paying attention, so on, then it's going to make a tremendous impact on your life. But there are many ways to do this work and not pay attention and not realize that life is fragile and life is not simple. Um, and in order to do it well, it requires a great deal of humanity, humility and presence and the ability to learn and self-reflect. And that has nothing to do with what you learn in school and everything to do with who you are as a human being. Um, there's, I just want to share the story. It's a great story. Um, there was a, uh, the Tavistock Clinic is one of the most famous clinics in the world. You had some of the best, best, best teachers of all time have trained in that clinic. It's in London. And one of my, one of my teachers, uh, Yalom, Irving Yalom, um, was invited to go down to Tavistock for, uh, for a year. He did an internship there. And he was a part of the final group of a therapy group that took place for like 20 years. And he was witnessing this final group, a psychoanalytic group. Uh, very well-respected adults in this environment. And he sat there in this group as the members were saying goodbye to one another. And can you imagine once a week sitting with a group of people week in, week out, year after year, the amount of growth that people have, the amount of suffering that people have gone through and the, they merge the other side. And, and everyone went around the room pointing out how much people evolved and changed and became better human beings. And it became clear after a while that the one person in the group who did not change was the analyst himself. And the analyst was all proud of himself. And he turned to Yalom and he said, look, my boy, that's the, a great example of good therapy. You know what I mean? Sort of like even keeled and I was professional and I guided this amazing process. And, and Yalom was writing about this later and I feel the same way that it's impossible to, to be so close to transformation to be so close to people who are willing to be vulnerable and to risk their lives to, to, with the hopes that it could be a little bit better later on. It's impossible to be close to those people and not be changed by it. But unfortunately, there are plenty of people who aren't changed by it because they're not listening and they're not paying attention. Um, and the greatest teachers in, in my life have forever been my clients. And I believe that they will forever remain my clients. They do things that I'm brave enough to do. Um, so we're working it. Mordechai answered directly like everybody else. This is just how I feel. And being human, making your way through life is not a simple thing. And just because you know something, it doesn't mean that you are that thing. Um, it's just that you know it. So I'm grateful for knowing a lot. But at the same time, we're all in the trenches trying to work it out together. And uh, yeah, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful question. Thank you, brother. So that means that when you sit with clients, you can actually relate to what they're feeling. Or when you're supervising, you don't feel like, okay, you're a therapist, your wife's a therapist, so both of you know it all. Well, it's a choice I make. I allow myself to relate. I find if I'm with a client and I don't relate to their sense of humanity, um, I'd have a really hard time doing good work with them. Um, and uh, there are lots of what I would call like... Uh, shared human experiences that I may not have gone through everything that the people I've worked with have gone through, but I could relate on some level to at least elements of it. Um, and yeah, there's a lot, I got, there are many different styles to therapy. Uh, but in my office, there's a lot of heart, a lot of soul, a lot of relating um, and a lot of feeling and, and very limited amount of analysis. Um, but again, there are many different styles to the way we do our work. Um, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. I allow myself, really really care wow. Thank you very much. let me ask you one more question it's a hypothetical question and then we'll go to closing and we'll leave off with some physic okay here's the hypothetical question you ready yes i just want to thank you mordechai for for your question i love it brother <laughs> i'm with you dr perlman is an objective of marriage to become one or is it to be two individuals together in a relationship what's the objective of marriage yeah i um I think we've been speaking a lot about this tonight. It's very clear that the more, the more wounded a person is walking into a marriage, the more they need the other to complete them. Um, so their mindset going in is we need to be a, we need to develop a symbiotic relationship. We need to become one. Um, and I think you see a lot of that, especially in like teenage relationships, you know, like uh, we're one and the same. Um, and I think the reality is that the most honest, respectful, loving relationships are those where you really understand that you're different people. I think there's something very nice about presenting this way because it's very clear to the audience 
that my wife and I are different human beings. We think differently in many respects. Uh, and I think that that's what makes for a lot of the, a lot of the care that we have for one another is because we're different, not because we're the same. Um, and, and that allows us to celebrate that difference. Um, and learn from that difference and appreciate that difference. And um, so clearly the, the, the belief system that I carry when it comes to the ideal you know, marriage, it is one where you really learn to respect and care for the other as a separate entity from yourself. And you also at the same time learn to honor and respect yourself as a separate entity from your spouse. Yeah. You feel the same way? Yeah, I, and I think that I think that those two spaces actually, they sound paradoxical, but I think they go together. I think like has been said before, um, that the leaning into the unit and thinking about the needs of the other makes you into a better self. And, and that makes you into, you shed parts of you that are not your real you, and you enhance parts of you that are more real you. And, you are a better self when you're in this unit and the unit becomes more strong because of the two separate spaces. So I would say, you know, if the relationship is the client, you know, let's say, and the two hands are like this, then, then the, as you become more and more defined and strong as yourself, then the space becomes smaller and smaller between the two of you, but also yourself becomes stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm and more and more defined. Um, so it's both. You become more of a unit and you become more of a self. Beautiful, let's go to closing. So back to promo, let me know who's gonna go first by the closing, just to leave off with a little chizik, but I'll start wrapping it up over here. It's late already. Uh, first of all, big, big shkoyach to Dr. Kiva Perlman and Dr. Tamar Perlman for coming on tonight. Tremendous chizik, it was a very, very deep program, inspirational. And uh, I think we could talk about marriage forever. I think there's so much to just keep on talking about it. And uh, again, tonight's show is sponsored by Avit, Avit Nisrael Mekili in memory of Wallstein. And again, if anybody wants to join the flyers, please WhatsApp me at 848-525-0066. And I'll send you every Sunday the flyers. You could also go to menachembarenfall.com and sign up for the weekly flyers. Again, anybody's here for the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on this Zoom share, we have different topics, different Rabbanim. Next Sunday, May 22nd, we have a, let's, let's say, I don't want to say a continuation, but it's going in down the same path. He's a Lubavitcher Shliach, who's a Shliach there for 28 years in Panama City. His name is Rabbi Aaron Lane. He wrote a book called GPS for a Happy Marriage. He's a big speaker. He speaks around the globe. And um, he sent me the book. I didn't read it yet. Me and Menachem hopefully will read it this week. It should be a very powerful and deep, meaningful program. So anybody who was here tonight, definitely could relate to that program. So uh, let's see what he has to say. Everything here is recorded. Make sure it will be on Menachem Bernfeld's website. If anybody has any questions, please email coachmenachem at gmail.com. Tonight's share is share 102. And if you want to hear it, make sure it will be on the phone tomorrow at 848-777-GROW. And again, a thank you to Lakewood Scoop, Rabbi Yenif Chazak, Eli and Ariel from the Five Towns Central. And a special thank you to Chayla Kaufman and Shmuel Summer from JCN. And um, I just want to end off saying it's, it's really amazing when you guys come on. It's, it's so powerful to see, you know, such an amazing couple just really breaking it down. I think we get both angles over here. You get the woman angle. You, get, you know, you always have a man presenter. You feel like the woman left out. You have the woman presenter. You have the man left out. Over here, you cover both angles. So it was really, it's really amazing. And um, thank you for agreeing to come on. Hope to see you again. Coach Menachem, closing. Okay. Shkoyach. First, I want to thank Dr. and Dr. Perlman. And uh, before I go to closing, I do want to give a shout out to Mordechai, which is very nice. And again, you're talking about people who sit, sit with others in that uncomfortable space, which we've heard a lot tonight in order to let go, in order to change, um, really being able to be there with the client, with the other person and help them see what it is and you know it's it's it sounds like a real boot camp from being here tonight it's it's not easy stuff you know it sounded like um in the logical world sitting here understanding the steps okay but when people are really struggling and tried many years and have been been in therapy and it's nice to hear the concepts but it's they don't feel it's get they're, they're getting anywhere for them to be able to take a deep breath and just sit where they are 
and sit in that uncomfortable space. Like Viktor Frankl says, between stimulus and response, there's a space which we don't want to sit in. Very uncomfortable. But that's really where the change comes from, where the experience comes from. And for those, you know, most of us who bring along what we have from many years before, sitting in that space is not easy. So that's why we want to thank the therapists and the people out there that are there for, for, for us to be able to sit there and for those who need it. So Hashem should give them all koyach to continue and in Mitzvah, everybody should have siyata deshmaya, whatever they need, that they should understand themselves, understand the spouse, the spouse should understand them, hopefully in Mitzvah Hashem, and take it to the next level, next step, so that they can experience some more positivity in their growth. Thank you very much. Amen. Okay, before we go to closing, uh, Mordechai, somebody said they can't take you serious if you don't have a, a white towel wrapped around the head, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, Dr. Perlman, this is Perlman. Who's going first? Closing words, Chizik, wrap it up. Yes, this has been One such second, a... You know something? I want to I share something first with everybody. Somebody, somebody made something because they were so inspired by your words. Let me share something first. I'm going to share my screen. This is Perlman. This was made for you. Can you read it? Um... I'm not seeing the shared screen. We can't yet. see it yet. We can't see it. It says, okay, I don't know why it may be on the phone, but it says, the place where you have the least amount to control, you have the most connection. Dr. Ah. Tamar Coleman. There we go. Thank you. I, I, thank I, you. I, I send it to you. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. You know, I said what I, what was my main, thank you for having us here and for allowing us to be in this space and, Marriage is a hard thing to talk about because it's a, it's a hard thing to do, marriage. And what I wanted to give over today mostly was, was a sense that, you know, uh, um, you know, the question that we're asked, like, are we the experts? So, so you know, is, is, therefore, is it easy? And what I wanted to say is that for you to believe that you are the expert at your marriage and that for you to bring the hope back in the hope that you went in with and and if you can it doesn't have to be like you were telling that girl that's taken the brave, brave step of letting go of control and you were saying it doesn't have to be all or nothing you could just take a small step at a time and and take a little step into more openness a little step into more unity a little step into the hope and that little step brings a lot when it comes to a relationship it really really does and it's and that will give you more power and it's gonna wet the soil and it's gonna you're gonna see how it doesn't take much of receiving and giving and then there is so much that can grow from that space. Um, so it's my hope, it's my prayer, it's what I wanted to give over is to go back to your hope. You can I want each and every one of you, if you want to, to think about this question of what is the quality of why you married your spouse. But again, it can only be one quality and the more core it is, the better. You know, it's uh, the more it has to do with who the other is that defines them. And in your dark spaces, try to lean into that because that's what gave you the hope then. And those are in those spaces when you don't feel like you forget, you forget as to why you made this choice and you have to remake that choice, that it helps you remake that choice. And that ultimately will also bring you to greater connection. And it was an honor to present alongside you um, and to, you know, I, I learn so much, like you said, from my clients about marriage, but really I learned the most about marriage from you and honored to present with you. And I hope that, I hope that you benefited, that everyone benefited. Thank you, love. The, um, I just want a, a very quick final word. You know, there's a statement that says you can't you can't love another unless you love yourself, um, which is a very positive and, and well understood statement that if there isn't self acceptance, it's going to be really hard to learn to accept another. And I just want to shift it a little bit uh, based on one of my teachers. He said you can never love a single person unless you love everyone. Um, and there was there was a power in that statement, which says that many of us, we come from hurt places and places where we feel rejected and dejected and disconnected. Um, and 
we have a choice of either surviving in this world or rising above it and allowing ourselves to see the good, even though most of the, most of the world that we see could be filled with darkness. We could choose good. This, we could choose suffering. Uh, it's a choice that we have. And the idea of you can't love a person unless you can love everyone, it, it speaks to this fundamental concept of what love ultimately is. It's ultimately a choice where you could say, I, there are different ways to live in this world. We could live with hurt. We could live with resentment. We could live with pain. Um, or we could choose to live with love. And that love starts primarily with ourselves first and extends itself to all people. And that belief that if I could find myself lovable, then I could certainly find another lovable because we're, we're all a work in progress. Um, so that's my only hope and my only bracha for a soul is that we find that strength uh, to really, really love ourselves. And in doing so, the ability to love everyone else in return. Um, and if we're able to do that, I know the world would be the world is wonderful as it is, but it would be significantly better if there was just a little bit more love um, and that love extending from oneself all the way through through others. Because once you see it as it's a choice, as opposed to something that you just discover and you got lucky with, you see it as something that you've chosen and nurtured on your own, then you could see that in others too. Um, and I just hope and pray that we find that within ourselves and certainly find it by extension to everybody else. And thank you again for having us. It's just a great honor to be here. I love what you guys do. It's really special. Thank you. I love you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. See you next week, Sunday night, May 22nd. Same time, same place. Good night. Thank you again. Oh. Bye -bye.